Today we have a treat for you. We are sitting with the man, Brad Roulier, right here. The one of the coolest entrepreneurs in all of Colorado, from Colorado. But I mean, he's influenced the music scene. He's influenced the bounce scene. <laughs> he he literally jumps around. He's been on world tour multiple times. He's he's played with some of the biggest names in electronic music across the world. Uh, super impressive, Brad. Man, thanks for, thanks so much for coming on the show today. How's it, how's it going? Awesome, man. Great to see you, boys. Known you guys <laughs> for a long time, so it's good to. Uh be recorded on what we say which most of the time we've been talking to we usually <laughs> not want to be recorded yeah yeah exactly like we should not talk about that on <laughs> film <laughs> but also today really cool and super happy to have a show is actually our producer he's kind of he, he, he's like our dr dre he's our producer in the house uh uh sammy t aka shoebox moses uh here also you know throughout the world on the mic with the DJs and everything else. But also, if you didn't realize this, he also produces some pretty amazing podcasts uh, and has been for so long. So two guys that I've I've known personally for a long time that know each other, super cool. So an awesome way to kick off uh, what we hope is a, a really neat way to highlight a lot of entrepreneurs such as yourself throughout the Denver metropolitan and Colorado area. Awesome. Well, thank Thanks, you for having Jake. me. Yeah, and Brad, Absolutely. thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be riding the coattails of Brad for, gosh, over a, two decades now. Right? Yeah, man. In 2004, Beatport was, I think Beatport was founded in 2004, was it? Yeah, January 7th, 2004. And you were uh, bartending at the roof on vinyl. Never forget <laughs> that. I mean, was it like just giving like free drinks out to everybody, Sammy? <laughs> oh man i definitely like that poor heavy that's for sure well, you know one of the crazy things brad when you started beatport i had just learned about digital music we were listening to djs like cascade on the rooftop that had maybe 400 people there at the time and now he sells out 150 to 200 thousand person festivals and you guys really gave him a shot in my opinion, no, he was on smaller. I mean, that, that's just one of the many. You guys brought so many incredible acts through Denver, through Colorado, and catapulted them in the stardom because they got their they get their outlet and their music through Beatport. Well, yeah. So I mean, does that ever? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, let's talk about Beatport real quick. I mean, for those people out there that know about Beatport, Beatport, but also for those that don't know what Beatport is or or and how it works, like. How did you get the idea to do that, and 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 like, what's the inspiring moment that really brought that about? I mean, there was a couple. There was a couple of things that really made me want to do Beatport. Um, I remember, so I was throwing raves back in the late '90s. Yeah, and I very, I, 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 not many people have known this story, but I was very confused. I had uh, Josh Wink come in. I think it was the Skylab or something, one of those parties, and we had to go buy a CDJ 100. Okay. And, you know, back then we were throwing rave parties. Everything was on vinyl. This was probably 19, uh, this was probably 2000, 2001 maybe. Okay. And, you know, we had to, we were rave promoters. We were cheap. So, like, we had to go buy this Pioneer CDJ100. So I bought it and, you know, we hooked it up and, you know, the DJs were our friends. And I was like, Josh, why do you need this CD player? You play records. And he's like, Brad, it's really cool because if I'm working on a record, I can burn it to CD. I can play it at Skylab tonight or whatever party it was. You know, there's going to be 5,000 people. Right. If I get a good reaction, then I'll know to press it to vinyl. Um, so I can just like kind of test it. I was and like, cool. Then when I took over for Reg uh, then I took over the church and vinyl, yep. the bookings, and I had to buy the CDJ. At that point, it was the CDJ 1000s. And then I could just see from, you know, 2000, 100% of every track was played on vinyl. And then by 2001, maybe 95. By 2002, 90. Then I think it was, again, Carl Cox was, this, was the same thing. Uh, had the same question with him. I was like, so he's playing all on CDJs. And this was probably 2003. And I was like, Carl, you're playing really? All, all CDJs, no vinyl? And he goes, um, and, this may, and this stuck with me forever. He's like, well, when I come to the U.S., I can bring maybe 35 records. Mm -hmm. You know, their records are heavy. So I'm playing the same set every night over and over. And maybe I can go to New York or L.A. and Chicago, maybe pick up one or two records. But for the most part, I'm going to play the same set 
everywhere I go for the whole for the whole show. There's only so much I can do. When I have CDs, I have 5,000 songs, and he's like, I can be a much better DJ for you because I can read the crowd. And then it kind of triggered like, oh, well, there should be a digital... You should be able to buy it digitally. You know, if they're going to play it digitally, then they can buy it digitally. And then uh, Jonas and Eloy came up to me with the idea, and I was like, "Cool, you guys don't know anybody. I know everybody." So yeah, you guys, wow. you guys kind of build the website, and I'll try and work on getting it promoted and getting you know the top 100 labels on there, and so on <laughs> and so forth. But it was really Josh Wink and Carl Cox, those two like real serious conversations. Yeah. Um, where I, you know, had a good enough relationship to be able to ask them why, why are you doing this? I always, you know, in my whole professional career, the smartest people I ever talked to always ask me a lot of questions. And I, I try to learn from when I don't know something like, why do you do this? Why would you do that? You know? Sure. And it's always, uh, when you talk to smart people and you ask why you usually get a lot of information. Josh Wink and Carl Cox told me why they were playing CDs and I... I that was, and you were clearly paying attention. And I was clearly paying attention. <laughs> so, and you're how old when this is happening? Uh, we don't like to talk about our age, but I was, <laughs> you know, I was. We're, in not, my, we're I was not. We're not women. We're uh, okay, yeah. man. We, we, it's all right. <laughs> I was in my early twenties. Yeah. Well, because yeah. you, I remember because I, I mean, I was, I'm just a little younger than you, but you were coming up, and we were, I mean, we were going to those parties, mm -hmm. obviously. Uh, uh, when you took over with Regis, and then you know, obviously, then when when you transitioned into Beta. And so it, how does that transition work, right? Because obviously Beatport got sold for, uh, did you sold Beatport? Yeah. Um, and that was to Sony? That was to SFX. SFX, okay. And so after that, you, you, you get into, you decide you're going to start one of the coolest nightclubs in the country, in the world, and build one of the best sound systems. Like, how does that all happen? Like, how does that come from Beatport to being like, no, let's go all in and actually book it all out ourselves? Um. I mean, it was in a very weird dynamic, right? So as a promoter, I was very successful. Um, then I'm a prom then I take over the, the, the nights at the Church of Vinyl. So I'm doing Thursday nights at the Church and Saturday nights at Vinyl. Um, and, you know, having we had a lot of success, I think, yeah. it, on Thursdays. Yeah, you did. I don't think we had a night less than 1,000 people. <laughs> Um, for I can about, attest to for that. about seven years, <laughs> and then on Saturdays, you know, vinyl had some ups and downs, like literally the building falling down. But when vinyl was really, that was after that snowstorm, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> but when vinyl was going really well, you know, we were consistently doing fifteen hundred person nights, and then Beatport went from a zero company to two hundred fifty thousand in revenue the first year, to two million the next year, to eight million the next year, to sixteen million the next year, to forty million the next year. Um, there was like a dynamic of I can't be working for Regis. Like, first of all, I see the other nights that aren't yeah. nearly as busy as the nights that I'm doing. And I don't, at the end of the day, I don't really have that much control. He gave me as much control as he possibly could. I, I booked the DJs, I can, did all the marketing. Um, you know, it was, it was my nights and it was, he pretty much let me do what I wanted. But at the end of the day, I wasn't. I, I couldn't manage the bartenders up on the rooftop. I couldn't manage the cocktail waitresses. I couldn't manage the bottle service. I couldn't manage, you know, I wasn't, yeah, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't my club. And so, um, it was, you know, it was always my dream to own my own nightclub and who wants to work for Regis, you know, for, <laughs> for forever, you know, I mean, I worked for him for a very, for a very long time. We had yeah. a, a very good relationship, as good of a relationship as I think anybody had. Um, I, def I definitely put in a pretty solid offer to buy the church. Uh, we talked about it for about a year mm -hmm. and couldn't get anything done. And, you know, there's only X amount I could do. Yeah. And I was there for seven years from 2001 to 2008. Right. So at my, from my point of view, it's like, if you're not growing, what are you doing? Like we sure. were just c constantly maintaining. And so I just wanted to have, you know, more control. So I, I did beta before be uh, Beatport sold. Beatport sold in 2012. Okay. And so beta opened in 2008. And so that was, that was a really tough decision. Like that's a big, it was a big space. Cause it was, it had been a couple of things before that. Right. It was like Dick's last resort. And then it was rise. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, Kind of nothing had really succeeded there the way that you made that corner succeed. Once you took it over and made it into beta, it's like kind of everybody's like, man, you know, is this one going to last? And it's like, yeah, 
it's going to be just fine. <laughs> I mean, you did such a great job on that. Like, so how does that concept like play out? It's like you had seen all these things go in there. What, did it make you nervous at all before you pulled the trigger on that? Or were you just like, no, nah, we got this? Um, I mean, I was a rave promoter, so nothing's more scary than selling 10,000 tickets to a rave and not have a venue, you know, five days before your show. So I kind of grew, uh, I mean, and then working for Regus for seven years, like I'm not big and strong and fight or anything, but like one of my superpowers is I'm, I'm not scared of anything, you know, like, I, love that. I mean, even doing beat, beat port, like we understood the magnitude of how big and how fast it was going and the 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 issues that we had with publishing houses and in you know lawsuits and all kinds of stuff like you know fear is not you know i think that's i'm not that smart i'm not all these things but i'm i'm definitely not scared to do things and a lot of people I'd say you're pretty smart you should you know <laughs> you've made hear, some good decisions in your life <laughs> i hear a lot of you should do this you should do that i'm my always thing is like i'm an idiot like you know i throw raves and like house music like <laughs> do it you know Go but you don't just like house music. I mean, obviously, I mean you've you've taken it and you've and you've you've transitioned house music uh, because I mean all of the major DJs in the world use Beatport now, mm -hmm. um, and you know the uh, it wasn't just beta. You also learned yourself and taught you 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 learned how to DJ. You built your own super group. You went on tour. With the manufactured superstars, right? I mean, so it's like beta, beatport beta is all happening, but you go out on tour. Like, how does that? How does that all happen? Um, As I remember when you were practicing, <laughs> so I remember listening to you <laughs> when you were actually getting on the ones and twos back in the day before you launched the manufactured superstars. But then all of a sudden, you're like, you're on tour. So yeah. like, how does that go? Uh, I mean, manufactured superstars was its own kind of monster that kind of, kind of took its own life. Um, Sean and I were down in uh, Buenos Aires for the South American Music Conference, and Above and Beyond was playing. And uh, Above and Beyond was playing on Ableton Live. Mm -hmm. And I was confused. So I was like, Sean, <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing? You know, I mean, we, we were good friends with all the Native Instruments guys, and they had Tractor. Ableton was from uh, Berlin as well. So we were pretty into the DJ software thing. And I didn't really get what Ableton was. And so Sean's like, basically, they're taking the recording sessions and they're just basically playing back live. I was like, are they doing anything? He's like, not really. Um, they're just kind of playing their album. <laughs> okay. And I was like, well, what if I put all my favorite songs in there? Could we just DJ with it? And he's like, yeah, but it's not really supposed, it's not what it was like really meant for. But I was like, that would be fun. I can take all my songs that I like and we can chop them all up and uh, put them together. Okay. And, and so he's like, yeah. And I was like, let's do it. And then we start, and then we did it and I they sound, it. and they sounded terrible because nothing was on key, nothing was in sync. And so we just like would get like Eric Prids and Dead Mouse drum loops and put it over the top. And so, I mean, that was kind of like the manufactured superstars, what our style was, which to this day still works in Vegas. I think we were like the really first ones that were like kind of the house mashup guys, you know, that take a very familiar vocal yeah. and throw a really cool beat and yeah. an unusual drop. Like Marshmallow doesn't exist without you. I wouldn't say that, but <laughs> but if you hear, you know, if you hear, if you hear any DJ in Vegas, that was that was what we were doing in like when, with our first residencies at the Palms and then XS was very. Uh, it was a very, it was a very like hip hop formula, but with, formulated to dance music. Very popular vocal, mm -hmm. consistent 128 drum with drop it, have a unique drop and get out of it quickly and just, you know. So our thing was that we could do, you know, 50 to 100 tracks, um, pieces and like we never play a whole song. We always just play pieces and parts. Uh, but we just try, you know, my, my thing was walking into excess. My goal was. I hear all these people that only, only want to listen to hip hop. That's all I hear from all these like more mainstream yeah, yeah. hot chick girls. My whole goal was to make them like house music. The way to do that was through chop it up, chop it up, good vocals, and just like I said, dead mouse beats every time. Any, <laughs> anytime we're in doubt, <laughs> just throw, it on. throw a dead mouse beat chop underneath it up it. there. Chop it up with that. Okay, I love that. I mean, <laughs> that's the formula for success. That's right the there. formula for success. We we rode that formula for a minute. I love that. For I love a hot that. minute. You can 
guys were the pioneers in mashups for sure. I remember hearing some hip hop tracks in 128, and I was like, "This is totally working for me." Yeah. <laughs> would you say we never Brad got too? Would you say? No, you stayed right in that we pocket, that fast right moving there. pocket. <laughs> one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Do you think that that uh, the way you revolutionized music with Beatport and all those transformative? transformational kinds of things you guys did transformative music. yeah transformative <laughs> were was that a philosophy that you always held on to that kind of helped you with all these future endeavors i know that's kind of a heady question but you seem to have a very distinct way of seeing into the future with things um yeah i mean beatport's just an entirely different philosophy but it's you know, where, where we got Beatport so right was the behavior of a techno DJ to a drum and bass DJ to a Psytrance DJ to a house DJ to an electro house DJ, that their behavior is all the same, but they want to get to their content. So Sammy loves techno. He hates trance. You yeah. love trance. I hate both of them because I like drum and bass. And so <laughs> what we wanted to do was make sure that the, the DJ... Um, who really wants new content always yeah. could get to the content that they want as quickly and painlessly as possible. Um, so, you know, the subgenres that we do within dance music, which I think now on Beatport, I think there's like 30, um, you know, Apple music says dance music and they put yeah, they all, 30 of those, all 30 of those subgenres in together where Beatport separated them all out and then subgenres of subgenres, you know, came. And so that if I'm a Tech House DJ, I, could, I don't have to listen to anything but the newest releases of Tech House. If I'm a, and, and these guys are all so new music driven. Right. Like the commercial DJs, they'll play the same set over and over and over again. If you're a techno DJ and, you're, and you play the same set twice, like you'll, in Berlin, you'll be like, ostracized <laughs> yeah. like it's just it's just not what you do you know like yeah no totally i mean that i mean that makes total sense i guess is there are there people that are actually like tracking that is there like somebody that will call you out if, if you did that like will people will somebody like attend like a concert the night before and be like no 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 like this is i mean yeah <laughs> i mean they have the track listing 101 that just you know that that will list every track that you play. I mean, you know, and we were in headquarters was Denver and Berlin. And so Berlin was like the epicenter of, you know, club kid, cool techno. Yeah. I mean, I just don't think Richie Houghton would do that, you know, like, you know, <laughs> yeah. and if, if you're a techno DJ, you aspire to be Richie Houghton. If you're a drum and bass DJ, you aspire to be Andy C. Mm -hmm. If you're a trans DJ, you aspire to be Armin Van Buren. Those guys just don't, Back then, in 2004, when we started, they just didn't do that. Like, they're always about trying to get, you know, and Sammy could attest to this. DJs are always like, when was your best set? Well, the last one I played. Yeah. Like, every time you DJ, it should be the best the best you ever did. Sure. Uh, you should always be getting better and adding new music and changing stuff up. You know, when you start getting into the more commercial stuff, the more David Guetta, the more... Uh, Swedish house mafia type of stuff, and then it becomes, you know, back to, you know, all the productions choreographed. It's the same set every night. But for the DNA of Beatport was much more, like, um, you know, much more in the techno world. Okay. Not more in the more mainstream dance well, world. Well, onto that mainstream kind of question because, like, you've toured and you've had. So not only have you booked some of the best talent and mainstream talent. And, you know, I would say, you know, uh, kind of up and comers, uh, uh, you've had the opportunity to really rub shoulders with some of the biggest names in the world um, and, and and not just have them in your club, but also tour with with these folks. I mean, are there any really cool memories that really come to mind when like when you were when you were doing those things, when you were when you were when that was like when you were in the thick of it during the beta and, and, and manufacturer superstars days? Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Come on, give it like, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's an unfair. You know we had to ask, that's man. That's an unfair like, that's question. Gonna... <laughs> I mean, there was a couple times there was just like some just like kind of surreal moments. Um, like EDC, the last one in the Coliseum, EDC, the first time they did it in LA, I think we were playing in front of 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one time at Excess. Calvin Harris open for us. I still always like that one. <laughs> <laughs> do you like do you like throw that one in his face every now and then? <laughs> like, you remember when you opened for me, bro? <laughs> um, 
you know, just, I mean, God, that's, I, I have to think about it, but there's just, you know, just so many times where like, is, is this surreal? And, yeah. you know, I mean, Tiesto is one of my good friends. I mean, anytime we played with him, I think it. Yeah. I mean, ridiculous. Yeah, just, just, just <laughs> yeah. you know, we played with him, I think two or three years in a row. And I mean, people it, pay $40,000 to stand in the DJ booth with Tiesto, man. I mean, that's. <laughs> I do think one of my favorite, I'll give you one, one of my favorite stories is, um, so we were supposed to play. We were supposed to headline "Surrender" mm-hmm. in in at at. And our residency was always with the Win or was with XS, and we usually always played Night Swim. That was we kind of started that yeah. with Jesse and Sai. So Night Swim was kind of always where our residency gigs kind of played out. Um, but uh, the Surrender guys wanted us to have. They're like, "Hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, you're gonna this year you're gonna play some Surrender and some yeah. Encore Beach and some Trist, but m- most of the shows will be XS." Like, okay. So you, they make out your your Vegas schedule kind of pretty far in advance, probably mm-hmm. like five months or whatever. So it's like, okay, we're going to headline Surrender this one day. So then uh, they call us up and said, hey, will you guys co-head? Because we were booked first and we were we were kind of the first ones that always would sign up every, every year. And yeah. they were pretty loyal to us. So then they yeah, called, You guys were out there for a while. And then they called us and said, hey, Rehab is going to play with you. Are you guys okay with that? And they're like, yeah, Rehab's our buddy. Sure. And then, like, three weeks later, get another call, like, hey, we're really trying to get a residency with Tiesto. Would that be okay if he played with you guys at this, <laughs> at this Encore Beach? Like, <laughs> oh, my God. Like, yeah, yeah. Cool. It's, 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 I think we're okay with that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and so it ends up being – so they end up doing it. And so Rehab is going to open. Then Tice is going to play the um, the main slot, which is, like, 3.30 to 5.30. And then we were going to close 5.30, and they usually close at, like, 7. Okay. Um, and it's just packed. Yeah, every single I time. Mean, like, like, For those of you that have not been to a Las Vegas pool, like club, <laughs> go at least one time in your life. It's it's worth seeing it. It is it is absolute pandemonium. It is out of control. It is so much fun. Uh, yeah, and an awful lot of skin in the game out there. <laughs> so so rehab does his set. Goes on, play, place goes bananas. So Tice goes on at like, uh, so he's supposed to play three, I think three thirty to five thirty. Yeah. So Tice is playing in, t- it was like August, I believe. So it was, I, I vividly remember it was one hundred and seventeen degrees that day. <laughs> and Encore Beach, the way the <sighs> brutal, way brutal Vegas Encore summer. Beach, the way it's set up is the um, the DJ booth is probably in the worst place in the world at four to like five. Everybody is protected. It's kind of like a yeah, but that sun's coming right in that angle. I mean, angle and right you're there. just getting yeah. absolutely <laughs> hammered with the sun, just baked. Yeah, <laughs> and so you know we're just kind of hanging back and surrender, um, just ha- hanging. And uh, uh, Tice like grabs me, like you know he's like we're coming up, we're having fun, and he's like, hey one more song uh, he's like hey you need to go on now one more song and i was like what i was like you just went on and he's like it's too fucking hot i can't see i'm out of music i was like i was like i've been with you when you played like five hours but i'm not here to argue with tiesto so like you know kind of run in my bag i gotta find sean like and he's like playing a song and he's like literally like w- one more like I'm done. And it's not even, it's, at this point, it's like 4.45, and I mean, sold out, packed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And he's a God. big name to sell out. And he's yeah. a big name. Yeah. I mean, he's played for about 40 minutes at this time. And so, you know, oh, we get our stuff up, and we, you know, we go on, start rocking it. And, like, Steve Wynn's there, Jesse's there, Sean Christie's there, and oh everyone's like, where God. the fuck is Tiesto? And I was like, he's back there in the air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then they like you kicked him off, and I was like, <laughs> "Yeah, I kicked Tiesto off, bro. Yeah, no, that didn't happen." <laughs> I was like, "I swear, I was even telling him he needed to play longer, and he just told me oh he's not." <laughs> he told me you guys need to put in some shade over there. That's what he was saying. Oh my! <laughs> Tell Steve God, Wynn to get on top of that. <laughs> These story. DJs are dying. <laughs> Bradley has these stories coming out of his. Years, though. But just I to mean, be clear, he was there till seven, so it wasn't. Okay, he, right. he was enjoying us too. <laughs> but I think the people that got rinsed out on the uh, 
ten thousand dollar table that saw Tiesto for forty minutes maybe had a different opinion. <laughs> I mean, no, they loved you guys. They yeah, loved yeah, you I guys. guarantee you. You guys definitely throw a good party, <laughs> man. But I mean, the cool that the must cool have thing, been insane. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but having residency out in Vegas, I mean, there's like it's like a story almost every time you you get up yeah. there, right? I'm I sure. mean, every every time, like. Yeah, every week we were there, it was, it was a story. And I mean, because we weren't the most expensive in all things and we were there a lot, like we just kind of had a system and, yeah, you know, we'd meet at the Encore Bar and usually roll in about 100 deep and there was some pretty... Oh, I, I definitely came out to see you guys a few times, man. I, I actually had one of the first dispensary licenses out there, if you remember. So we were definitely doing those parties. <laughs> I had to... I had to concentrate and buckle down a little bit more out there so i couldn't show up as much as i would have uh, normally liked to back in like back in the beta days but uh it was uh it was definitely cool to come out there and see you uh hitting it up i'm like <laughs> well, always um, good times it was always man so i mean so from from all that right then it's you 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 uh you start this the opop co is that am i saying i'm saying it correct right yeah opop opop yeah. okay and and it's like the keurig like a like amazing popcorn. Yeah. So like, how does that trend? Like, how do how do you yeah. go from all of that, and and it's like everything having to do with like electronic music, and now, the the popcorn company, which is which has been widely successful. Yeah. I mean, you've seen it on like USA Today. You got. I mean, you guys have been all over the place. Uh, I mean, I can't open up my Instagram and not see an advertisement. So I mean, I don't know if people realize in Denver. Like, first of all, let's make very clear: this guy is from Denver. And he's we we are, we are only about halfway through the story, <laughs> and so you know so how how does that how does that all of a sudden come to fruition? Uh, I mean Jonas was my business partner at uh, Beatport, okay, and so he was working for Beats by Dre and then moved back to Denver, and we were just kind of hanging out and talking, and it was about 2016, and it was a time where I was really starting to get pretty tired of uh, I was getting older and you know we were doing about 150 shows a year that you know i was pretty clear with sean like this isn't sustainable i don't want to be do i can't do this like tiesto for and paul oakenfold and paul van dyke <laughs> i can't i can't do you know that that wasn't the right. that wasn't the plan right was to be a touring dj for um it just kind of happened like, i'm a business owner <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah it kind of happened and it got it got it got bigger than we than I think either one of us did but you know I had other sources of income with the nightclub and with with Beatport and everything and yep. so Sean's at that time primary income was was manufactured superstar so I want to be very respectful of him like hey I can't do this forever but I will give you some time right um but uh, you know by about 2015 2015 was still pretty fun 2016 was starting to become a lot of, a, a lot bigger of a grind mm -hmm. At that point, we had kind of, you know, we, we put out two albums. We still had to put out one more, but we weren't like ascending. Like it's like when you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah. it's it's more fun when you're like, you know, our fees were staying the same. You know, there was a, a there was a lot of competition. You know, in that, and I was like, I don't want to be taking gigs away from other DJs that this is their lives too. So sure. there was like when you're kind of you're kind of. You're kind of threading that that you personally are kind of threading that line, right? Where it's like you're also Beatport, so all these guys are also depending on on that part of the. I mean, yeah. does, does, do you run into any of that? Like, well, I mean, you don't want to take you don't want to compete with them because ultimately they're still your customers. Yeah, and at that point we had sold Beatport, but it was again, it was like that wasn't it wasn't my life okay. goal to okay. like continue to be a touring DJ, but sure. be respectful of Sean, be like, hey, I can't do this forever, and so Jonas and I were just kind of shooting the shit and just being like, you know. Like, I'm going to probably be getting rid of beta soon. I don't really want to DJ anymore. I'm kind of tired of dance music. Let's let's think about doing something cool. <laughs> and then it was like kind of like, well, let's make popcorn cool. Well, what is the way to do that? And, you know, everybody has a criteria. Take a commodity and charge a premium for it. You sure. can't get, you know, can't get anything cheaper than popcorn and then, you know, charge a lot of money for it and just try to build a cool brand. And um, it was just kind of a fun kind of, project uh like kind of keep my like i if if you if you see a legacy with me there's always so i started throwing raves then i moved from raves to a club then i moved to the club to beatport then i then i moved beatport to continue to the club then i start dj and then yeah. i open up so the, if you notice there's a pattern that i'm always working on usually one two or three things yeah. simultaneously 
other things that aren't aren't nearly as big, but you know, so I'm always like, I guess hedging, um, main mainly because I kind of get bored. I can't just like work on one thing all the time. Sure. Um, to me, idle hands. I'm not that. It's not idle hands. It's, it's an like entrepreneur. Like I don't <laughs> do a lot of work either. Like I I come up with the ideas and then I put a team around me and kind of dictate what I want. And well, I mean, them... but that's I mean, still at the end of the day, you have to be the one to do that. Right. I, I mean that. I think a lot of people uh, understand that like that is that's a key role in an organization, yep. right? Coming from you know we're all business owners. I've seen how you've conducted yourself. I mean that's that's a skill in itself. Uh, I mean also to be able to go out and do everything else that you've done, but to be able to build a team like that uh, and understand how to put it around you. I mean that's that's a big deal. So um, so in 2016 we kind of came up with the idea, mm -hmm. and then it took about two and a half three years but we weren't like working on it like every day sure and then it just kind of just kept on gaining a little bit more momentum like wow this you know this is something that people could really want yeah um and yeah i mean we launched beatport or beatport we launched Op opal pop i believe in 2020 yeah. and i think now there's like Two hundred and fifty thousand customers, and yeah, you know. But again, um, a lot you know, of digital advertising. You guys have done great with that. Very smart advertising. You know, everything with that was D to C. We're still not in uh, any big box, but hopefully, you know, this year they'll get in there. But you know, I in and with all the businesses, you know, once it gets to a point, I kind of take a step back and you know let the smart people you know, go figure out the, the smart people problems. And, you know, whether it's Beatport, <laughs> whether it's Beatport or Beta or Opal Pop, you know, there's always like, you know, there's been really significant. So we're not going to see you sitting in the CFO's office just mm. hanging out. I mean, the CFO usually reports to me and I usually tell him to fuck off. <laughs> we're like, listen, man, I am the guy with the checkbook's worst fucking nightmare. I'll, I'll, give, you a, here, I'll give you a good story about our CFO from from Beatport. Do you remember, do you know him Sammy Chris, Chris Christoph? So oh, yeah. Totally. So he was this British guy that was mm -hmm. about so he's British and English or <laughs> no, you know excuse me, English and German. Okay. He was about 6'4 yeah. and he was like really really proper and he had a really high pitched voice. And, and he's six four. Yeah, I'm just trying like, to put this just together like a right now. Really, this is like an oxymoron. Really big, sophisticated German British guy. <laughs> And every time he would come to me, it was always a problem. And he would, um, uh, uh, Bradley, uh, I see there's a charge here for the 1220 Glenarm Street. Um, uh, uh, what, 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 what was that? Wait, wait. For, 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 for those viewers uh, that are from Denver, then you know what the Glenarm restaurant's all about. <laughs> if you don't, we highly recommend you come here and keep an eye on your receipts when you go to certain places. And I don't want to throw any DJs under the bus, but there was a DJ that I was entertaining, and the bill got a little higher than probably probably should <laughs> and you know he would um always come to me with a problem and it was always um um you know we're getting sued by ascap or we're, you know whatever it is and every time he comes into my office it's just like fuck <laughs> this but guy's I do, gonna come with a problem <laughs> but i do remember one day he came to me in the office in my office he's like oh you have a minute and i'm like yeah he's like we sell music 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 years 365 days a year in 182 countries every second. I was like, that's good. Yeah, and he just yeah. like storms so, off. Yeah. Sounds like, like we're doing pretty good, man. <laughs> I was like, wow, you told me something nice for once. <laughs> That's You're like, you know what? what? Remember that the yeah. next time you come in here with bad news, lead with something like that. <laughs> and then I remember one of, one, one of my very last transactions with him. You would know this, Sammy. We used to do the Beatport Beach Party in Miami. Oh, I love those. And the mm -hmm. last year we did it, we moved it to the Gansevoort Beach, and uh, <laughs> it got pretty out of control. So the first day, we get a ticket, and I'm the one that's promoting it, so I'm the one that has to deal with all this shit. <laughs> Second day, we get a ticket. And they're like, you guys need to, you guys need to chill out. And I'm just like, it's only gonna get worse. Like, the, uh, like we got dead mouths coming. We got yeah, Swedish yeah, yeah, houses. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah. this is just progressively. We're getting it ready to go. This is just Thursday. Is you the know? Beach, so the beach was at the top. Is that the top was pool, or is that is that connected to? Because it's. No, we just had a we just had like a beachfront area in front of the Gansevoort Hotel. Uh, the Gansevoort in Miami or the in Miami. Oh, okay. Because they yeah, so they, they brought a Gansevoort out to Vegas too, didn't they? 
Uh, it was connected to Mandalay Bay? Or no, it was the Delano. 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 Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so... Gansvoort is So, so this is Miami. So, so every year we would do these Beatport Beach parties, and then we used to do them at the National, and they outgrew the National. And so this was our first year that we were at the, um, at the moved it to a new lo- location. And so we, I get a ticket the first day. <laughs> police are pissed get a ticket the second day police are more pissed get a ticket the third day police are like you guys really need to like chill out and we're co-producing it with insomniac and there's like <laughs> and i think we were co-producing it with the, with the win as, as well i was like it's well i mean we're just not doing that you know going back to the no fear so sunday comes and i mean that we have we're, we're ending with Swedish House Mafia unannounced. Oh, Jesus Christ. So, so <laughs> about in their <laughs> prime, like every girl, like, oh my God. So about didn't t- love Swedish House Mafia. About two o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon, I get a ticket. They're like, we're going to be back in two hours. We're going to shut you down. I'm like, Four o'clock, get another ticket. They start checking all the boxes on the thing. Come back at seven o'clock. They're like, you got to shut this down. Another ticket. And I'm like, I just got to make it to 10. Like, you got to let me make it to 10. They're like, you got to turn it down. I'm like, no, <laughs> not turning it down. Which <laughs> <laughs> well, is funny because like right behind the Gansvort, it's ocean. So it's like, yeah, uh, I mean, on the one side, you got Collins and then the other side, you got the ocean. So it's like, it, yeah. it was reverberating through on the sides. <laughs> and we had a function one system in that. So which then, is yeah. South Beach. So then at still... 930, they're like, we're shutting you down. They check every box on the ticket. Public urination, public nudity, animal, animal cruelty, no. anything <laughs> that was on the box. Ritualistic slaughter they, of they, a goat. <laughs> they check the box. And they're like, we're shutting you down. And I'm just like wading through the crowd, just like, <laughs> just trying to get to 10 o'clock. Just like, you're not shutting me down till 10 o'clock. And finally, like, say like five, you know, five more minutes, five more minutes. I promise at 10 o'clock uh, we'll be done. And at 10 o'clock, we shut it down. And I had. I think so how many tickets throughout had, the three days? I had six. <laughs> And so I sent it to my boy Christoph, and he's like, uh, uh, "This is like seven thousand dollars in fines." I was like, "Like chalk that up to a marketing expense." He's like, "Should we're we good. dispute it?" I was like, "We're not gonna win." <laughs> we're not gonna Which win. Which is funny because one. like you go to South Beach now. Uh, I mean, it's I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's almost gotten back to like like Paradise Lost moment where you know, spring break is like turning into like shootings on the street and stuff. I mean, that's, so I, I would imagine that they would love to have your kind of problems again. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, South Beach is... I can totally see different. Christoph freaking out over that. That is a hysterical story. <laughs> wow. But the, I, I just so knew, good. I just like on Wednesday or Thursday when I got the first one, I was like, this is, isn't going to go well. <laughs> like, I oh love this God. line of questioning, Jake, because you, you went from, from popcorn... And then you went into Bounce Empire. I want to hear more about. We haven't how even you talked keep about Bounce Empire yet. Yeah. 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 How many more iterations do we have? We yeah. Have I mean, that's what thing. I said. I, yeah. I think I said it. we're not even halfway done yet. And so, so it's recently, so you you started the Bounce Empire, which for those folks uh, that are living up around the uh, Lafayette, Louisville, Longmont, Erie area, this is the guy right here. The the the, the man, the myth, the legend of. Now the Bounce Empire. Now the Bounce Empire. Which is amazing. I mean, tell us, like, how does that, how does, I, I that transition makes almost more sense than the popcorn one. Oh, right? yeah. Obviously, yeah. like, there's a bar, there's cool places to hang out for the moms and the dads, right? The kids get to kind of run around. So how, how does that all happen? Um, my business partner at Bounce Empire was probably about a year ago, October. So what would that be? Where are we? So about almost two years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like we were working on another project together and just a really, really cool guy, like sold his company for a ton of money, has four boys, just like a big kid, right? Just has the biggest house in Colorado, just just super <laughs> extroverted, just really, really fun guy. And uh, we became friends. I took him to Tiesto and took him to a few things and like we really, <laughs> we really got along well. And when we were working on these projects, it was, um, we were talking about working on this this gym concept and this bounce empire. And he's like, he's like, I have two concepts that I want to do. He's like, the gym that I'm working on that I want to do. He's like, it's exactly what I want to do. It's perfect. The other one is this bounce empire. And um, he's like, I just, you know, I came up with this idea about five years ago. He, my business partner, not me. 
and it's basically like you know you you take your you take your family or your your workers to Top Golf. The kids hate it. You take your family or your workers to Dave and Buster's. Um, the kids love it. The adults hate it. He's like, why can't there be a place that everybody loves? Uh, that's fun. That's like kind of gets gets everyone's phones out of their system, out of their hands. People play. It's super interactive, and you just 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 have fun. It's an indoor amusement park. Sure. So he was getting pretty aggressive about having a lot of problems, um, and wanted me to join him. And he's like, he's like, you don't want to do popcorn anymore. He's like, that, that's boring. He's like, you be- <laughs> he's like, you belong in the entertainment. You're like, well, I was kind of getting into popcorn because I was getting a little bit burned out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, um, he's like, you know, and he's not like a like he's a he's a proud guy. Like he doesn't like ask for you know he's not one of those things that like really ask for things. And I'm kind of dumb. Sammy and I are like the same thing. Like when there's girls that like us, we don't really understand that. They gotta like. Tell us multiple times. Sammy, do you concur with this? <laughs> I, uh, I totally resemble that remark. For sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so he's like, will you please come and see it? And I was like, yeah, of course, man. You're my friend. Like, you know, and I didn't, I didn't get it. Like, I just thought what everybody else thought. I thought it was like a bunch of bouncy houses and it was just a little thing. Yeah. And so I'm going over there and I'm like, who's your architect? He's like, I fired him. I was like, cool. Who's your general contractor? Fired him. Okay. <laughs> Who's your general manager? Don't have one. Okay. Who's your insurance? What's that? Okay. Do you have a liquor license? Want one? Okay. I was like, oh. See, uh, like I was saying, it takes you there that's a skill to be able to go in and be like, hey, listen. I was like, These oh, are all the things we need to have. So you probably need my help. He's like, I've been calling you a bunch. And he's like, oh, I was like, oh, I didn't really I thought you were being nice. Uh, I didn't think you actually needed my help. And so we walk into this 50,000 square foot warehouse and I was just like, where was this 20 years ago when I was throwing my rave parties? I was like, can we throw raves in here? He's like, throw one. Like, yes. He's right like, whatever now. you want to do. It Charge they, people out the door. Basically, he's just like, whatever you want. What do you want to do? See, I walk into a 50,000 square foot warehouse and I'm like, where was this when I was trying to grow copious amounts of marijuana? <laughs> so, you know, I kind of like dug in and just saw that I could bring a lot of value to what he was doing. And, I love um, it. Uh, you know, we opened up. We got all the problems fixed. Got a liquor license. Got approval from the beautiful city of Lafayette and Boulder County. <laughs> which is pretty amazing, by the way. Which is pretty amazing. <laughs> I mean, you've had experience, obviously, with some government regulatory agencies on the, yes, <laughs> throughout has, your career. Had some issue, issues with that. And, well, um, I will tell you this because the coolest thing. I, I so our our followers know that I grew up in Louisville uh, and went to Centaurus High School. So the coolest thing in Lafayette. Up until probably right now, until you was was uh, Coal Creek Sports Center. Remember the old bowling alley there, man? That was that oh, was it. Yeah. <laughs> Sammy My grew up in Longmont, so he knows school. what's up. Yeah, totally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so I know. Crazy. I know your mom from high school. <laughs> she, she was yeah, one of my that's teachers. So weird. <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> that's so weird. <laughs> I was definitely getting in a lot of trouble back then. I <laughs> believe that. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, that's such a cool area to give that to really uh because I, I i bet it's it was definitely right for that i mean have you guys been pretty busy is it is it i mean do you feel like it's off to a good start um yeah i mean there was there was definitely some challenges i mean the business model is 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 different we're like we're a high-end you know amusement park yeah um that goes from 10 a.m you know to 2 a.m and then transitions to <laughs> you know DJ stage and you know we haven't gone we haven't gone super crazy with that but you know to be able to it costs a lot of money I think we spent almost 15 million dollars on the build out wow so it's like you know it's in that top golf you know niceness uh what do they call it entertainment uh well, I forgot what the heck, there's a new word for it, but entertainment hospitality. Okay. Um, but because yeah, you guys have, I mean, you have like top line chefs, you've got a great kind of top shelf bar going on. I mean, you got anything from like Coors Light to like Oban Scotch happening in there. Yeah. yeah. So if you notice, like on a, on a typical Saturday, we'll do about 2000 people through the doors and that wow. starts at 10 AM and we can't handle more than like 500 at a time. Cause there's 
35 attractions and you know the largest that makes it a little bit more unique though right yeah and yeah. There's, so there's the you know 30 foot slides and an obstacle course that sammy would definitely beat both of us through <laughs> that like the cu football team goes through it takes them a minute to get through the obstacle course um uh, you know, do i hear a challenge i, I mean i think I, we have to get up there yeah. and we need cameras rolling no. all my money is on sammy all <laughs> of my money is on sammy hey man i'm all right being the underdog <laughs> you should have seen i had to get through so many linebackers to get to Brad at at vinyl and at the church because that place was packed. That's where I probably learned how to duck and weave so well. Those places Bob and were weave. Packed, getting up to Brad. <laughs> Bob and weave. I love it. I love Bob it. All right. Weave. Well, I mean, I think we just figured out an episode for later in the year. We're definitely gonna have to come up there. In fact, it would be pretty neat to shoot the podcast from from inside of yeah, that, that spot. That I think be, that would be a great spot for that. I mean, it really looks Sunday. like. Uh, I mean, I say. I guess this is an adult show, but I say like Dave and Buster's Top Golf and a Raver had a threesome. That's what Bounce Empire looks like. <laughs> <laughs> it's all these inflatable lights and all these inflatable things all over the place. I mean, it's sensory. Oh, I love that. I love we got a Lenium's old tour rig in the middle of the stage, and the stage goes up and down. It's 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 a lot. Don't go there if you're oh if you God. have sen oh sensory deprivation. No, 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 no. It's... I'm not. Well, you stay out in beta, so obviously I don't. <laughs> you know, we didn't even oh, cover man. Brad. This is such a throwback show. There's so many amazing Denverites in here that just love the old school Denver. I know you're a huge, yeah. huge basketball fan. Uh, and oh, you're actually yeah. really good at basketball. Who is your favorite? Freakishly good. Denver. Yeah, freakishly. It's super weird. Who's your favorite Denver Nugget of all time? Of all time? Mm -hmm. Good question. I mean, it happened from when I was, this is going to date me, but so I was really little, but uh, there was a guy named David Thompson when I was like really little. I think I went to his basketball camp when I was like five or six years old. Okay. Okay. And so I would say, that's how you know. That was I'm that a, like at McNichols Arena? Yeah. See, that's how we know. That's that how we're, we know. I, I, that's Was that during like the Bill Hanslick, <laughs> Alex English era or before that? <laughs> uh, that was before that. So that for was, those that was you, before the rainbow jerseys, right? So. Those before were epic, the though. Rainbow jerseys. And the short shorts, yeah. the '70s shorts, right? Like those, they were like the basketball players were like seven feet tall, wearing Daisy Dukes back yeah. then. <laughs> oh my god! But if you, so if you, yes. for for those of you Denverites that are that are that are that are new to the area, but calling this home, McNichols Arena was what we had pre Pepsi Center Ball Arena, yeah. right? That was where we went to see MC Hammer. Yep. Back in the day, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So and, and then I would then I would say like because then I'd see I had season tickets I'd fl for years when I had beta and so you know AI and Carmelo and Kenyon and Jr. Those guys would come to the come to beta a lot. Yeah, and so oh. that that whole era was a really was was a really fun time. That was a very yeah, very like fun tippers. time. <laughs> <laughs> they were light tippers. <laughs> what was always great though is I'm like, what? What was that? What was that? What was that? Right? So weird. Well, you remember Sam? We, we would be in there. Brad, Brad would have all these like crazy mega VIPs, and I would call, and he'd be like, "Dude, let me get you a really great table." And I'd be like, "Wow, I, know. I just you I know, know, man, I can't. I don't mind. I'm not gonna be able to pay the way those guys." He's like. It's come back on the DJ booth and let's hang out. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I know they, I like met Paul Oakenfold, David Guetta with you. I met uh, I met Tiesto. Uh, I mean, all because you were like pulling me back behind and letting me come back there and hang out. I mean, those were some. You epic were nights, absolutely man. an epic host. <laughs> it didn't matter how small or how big the DJ was. I remember Brad would just like grab me by the shirt and pull me back just to watch in awe, especially at beta to see the, the craziness that these DJs would send every night. And uh huge thanks for always just letting me sit there and watch that. It turned into my career later. How do you feel the Denver scene is evolving or devolving? What's going on with music now? Beta was beta was huge and obviously Beatport was such a huge part of music around the world. What do you, what's going on in Denver now? Uh I mean, you know, Ha's still one of my best friends and, you know, what Ha and Lance are doing with Global Dance is oh, yeah. pretty very impressive, you know. T Tiesto now lives here in Denver, you know. Um, Elenium's from here. Uh, you know, said the sky that you know the firm graphics. Shout out to Steve. You know, he's pretty much done every piece of marketing for me. Um, you know, since 
since the worst rave flyer of ever of uh i think it was digital 1998 that i still look at as the worst flyer that i've ever done seen it's probably entire. a great party though <laughs> but uh you know steve has been doing all the artwork for, for me for everything well, speaking that of that what do you guys send over here i got my bounce empire <laughs> uh, headphones no no i'm talking about the oh yeah my new project is uh you know a, de- a down tempo record label that uh I wanted to get back into the music business and start pr- producing. That's why we're in the studio right now. My engineer's over there mixing uh, a track right now for in Dolby Atmos for us. It's all like down tempo and chill out. Sammy knows. If you really know me, you know that I always like my chill out music. And so, um, when during, you say chill out, is that like Sade or Kenny G or like where are we at with chill out? Uh, we're more like Cafe Del far? Mar. Okay, all right, right. I'm like, a where little, are we going with that? <laughs> uh, you know, more like sound therapy. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Uh, you know, during the pandemic, I think all of us were really struggling. Yeah. Um, I was really having a hard time sleeping, not trying to pop ambient every night. Um, so I really, and I'm a big yoga person, so that's, everyone's like, why do you look so young? Maybe still, some yeah. people say that. I started doing yoga in like 2011, and pretty, do it probably two or three days a week. I meditate almost every night before I go to bed. And during the pandemic, I was just watching these 4K drone footage every night. On you know, kind of meditating, and I was like, well, "Fuck, I can make that." <laughs> um, and then Adelio, the guy who where we're at right now in the studio, just put in the first Dolby Atmos room, and he's talking about like, you know, playing music for like more pop. And I was like, I was just thinking like, could you imagine Calm in Dolby Atmos? How cool that would be! And then um, my <laughs> business partners, they're opening up a wellness center, and so uh, you know, we've been working on this the Sacred Society music. Uh, it's, it's a record label. It's an artist. That's us, and it's also a wellness center. And you know, it's just kind of all of us struggle. All of us um, uh, are looking for like sound therapy, sound that sound baths, all Absolutely. that type of stuff. So I've been uh, really, you know, and I wanted to get back into producing music again. And so you know, we're doing it under the Sacred Society brand. I th- right now, we have sixty-five tracks out, all in Dolby Atmos, all spatial audio. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really, really cool, interesting stuff. No, no epic drops or very, <laughs> very little drums. Uh, but when we do, edge, when we do do drums, they're pretty those. amazing. <laughs> Although it was pretty neat going into that studio and just seeing how the sound actually moves around. Uh, that I, I, I'd never, obviously, never seen anything like that because you are the only certified studio here in Colorado yeah. for that. So that's pretty neat. So that's why nobody's ever seen it. I got to see it, which was pretty cool. <laughs> but it's, that was it's really good. But you just go to Apple Music and check out Sacred Society if you want to hear some really. We have three big playlists. I think each of them have about thirty songs on it. Sacred Society, folks, right here, from the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Brad Rulier. Well, hey, man, just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. We hope you enjoyed it. For all of our viewers out there. This guy right here is the man. It's so neat to have him here. It's very exciting uh, to get the show jumped off, to have somebody uh, with this kind of background, with these kind of credentials coming on the show and giving 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 the channel some love. So thank you so much, Brad. That was awesome. Sammy, super, man, like super obviously. Fun. Like I said, you guys have been <laughs> in my you. life thank for, you for, taking us. for many, many years. So it's great years. to see you. You too, man. Love you guys.